of the Doug Town Show on Chop FM 102.7. I'm your host, Brad Joseph. On today's show, we feature the History Hound in our pre-Halloween special. We're going to talk about tombstones, graveyards, and ghosts. All the things that are coming out this coming Halloween. And by the way, I do believe Halloween is a goal. And uh, the, the kids will be out gathering tricks and treats for this uh, great occasion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the History Hound, Richard McLeod. Hello, Richard. Hey, boo, you hear you? How you doing? I'm getting scared already just thinking about Halloween. Yeah, oh. I don't know as much as Halloween as I once was, but I guess that's because my wife won't let me eat candy anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. I got less the pounds considering we're getting, coming close to Christmas and I don't really want the, the cavities uh, going to a dentist because I kind of detest dentists, but it's a necessary thing that we have to have in today's society. Oh, exactly. Well, let's get a bit of your background, Richard. I believe uh, you were once a grave digger in one of the cemeteries in Newmarket. Tell us about that. Yeah, actually, when I was going to university, um, you know, obviously, when you're going to university, you look for a good summer job, and uh, a family friend uh, was in charge of the uh, at the Protestant uh, cemetery on uh, North Main, and uh, so I got a job uh, working there. Uh, initially just for one summer, and then I went back for a second summer, so I was there for two years. And that was a cemetery in Newmarket? Yeah, yeah, in North Maine. How did you find that? And you were a younger then, were you not? Yeah, I was a young, way back when. Uh, how did I find it? Well, uh, it, it was a great job. Working outside was, was great. Um, it was strenuous work, but of course, you know, that's... When you're young, you don't really worry too much about that. Um, work with a good group of people, so that was always good. Um, one thing I would say, it's tough to 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 do that type of a job uh, in your own town because, you know, particularly in the second year, uh, we had an awful lot of, um, of deaths that were associated with people I knew. Uh, it was very, very difficult to, to do that. I give credit to people who, who do that for a living. And if I'm not mistaken from my records here, you have some relatives that actually owned uh, memorial uh, places that actually engraved the tombstones. That's right. Uh, my, uh, my family was involved in the tombstone business. Oh, I guess it, it started in uh, 1896, and... Uh, uh, the last of them was in the uh, 1990s, I guess. Uh, so for a long time, uh, Lucille Memorial at the corner of Maine and uh, Queen Street. And that and that uh, building is still operational, is it not? Yeah, still there. The building, uh, that particular building was, uh, as, it, as it is now, was built in uh, 1865. There was a, a building there before, but uh, that particular building dates back to 1865. It is in tough shape, there's no doubt about that. Well, it really amazed me about the engraving, and back in the day when they were just starting out, and your relatives, how did they actually engrave the tombstones? Because they don't have laser cutting and everything else that they have now. How did they go about actually engraving a lot of the names there? Well, actually, uh, my grandfather um, he had a hydraulic um, uh, tools started to come in, uh, but they still, interesting enough, they still needed to use this design, even though they, uh, they could now use power tools. And now, I guess, uh, you know, with the laser and everything, I guess it's a, it's a speed in the design and it does its thing. Now, back, you know, when, when was that established, that memorial engraving business in the tombstones? Well, the the, uh, the tombstone business, 1865, maybe a couple of years earlier, um, they actually moved there. Uh, there was two gentlemen who came together uh, and moved uh, down to Main Street. One gentleman uh, used to be on the Comsa Street, uh, if those people who aren't aware of where Comsa is. Comsa actually is just behind Main Street to, uh, to the west. Um, uh, so uh, the one gentleman who uh, was located there, uh, the other gentleman was located on Main Street, and uh, and two of them came together because the gentleman on Main Street, his place burned down. Uh, so uh, uh, they got together, um, and 
uh, uh, corner of Maine. Uh, the interesting thing is that one, uh, one gentleman who uh, uh, was in the business or set up the business before my, my grandfather came along, um, he actually owned the uh, uh, New Market's first sewing machine business. So he actually sort of owned a sewing machine business on that, that premises, and there used to be a, uh, a building where they, they sold sewing machines. New Market sewing machines. Yeah. Well, I guess back in the day, they had no modern transportation. I guess they, they transported everything by, by horse or by buggy or by something. Yeah, exactly, by horse and buggy. And then, of course, uh, you know, in the uh, late in the 18th, uh, 1800s, uh, the uh, Metropolitan Railway came to, to Newmarket. And so uh, for anybody who would buy uh, the shop, that's what I call the shop or the, the, the uh, Lutheran Memorial, you know, it was big sliding doors still there. Uh, so what used to happen was that the train used to pull off beside the building and uh, they would unload the stones from, uh, from the train, from the, uh, the freight section of the train. Because the train uh, went right by there, uh, very close to the building. Now, I also have some records here said, you also have a, you, you recently toured some cemeteries in, in Newmarket, you found some really, uh, Interesting facts about some of the people that were buried there. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your your, your journey through some of the cemeteries here in the market? Well, because uh, you know, this is a family business, uh, my father was uh, was ill almost all my life, or all uh, when I was young, and so uh, my grandfather and my uncle used to babysit for me. And of course, part of babysitting was to take me uh, with them when they went to the cemeteries, and so I. I got very used to going to cemeteries, and of course I would wander around and, and look at the stones. Uh, but from, I guess, from about, uh, what, 1978, 79, uh, I started doing tours of uh, both the Catholic and the Protestant cemetery on North Maine, as well as other cemeteries, because uh, I was surprised at how interesting it was, and, you know, I thought that other people would be interested. Uh, which they work. You know, one of the more popular um, tours that I do is we're going to talk about the second most popular, which is the ghost uh, tours, but uh, later on. But uh, I would say probably the most popular, and the one that sells out very quickly, are the tours that we do of cemeteries. There's so much you can learn from cemeteries. There's a language to, to, uh, to teach. Here with you, we talked about Spanish flu, and one of the interesting things about uh, any cemetery is that, that you'll notice that there's just a, an enormous number of people uh, who died and were buried in uh, that period from uh, 1917 all the way up to 1920. Uh, it was a massive loss of, of life. It was amazing. So that's, that's also, uh, uh, you know, you can get history um, walking through uh, cemeteries. You can pretty much guess uh, what was going on in the world. Just off Davis Drive here in the market, has there been any graveyards that have actually been paved over at all? Like uh, not, the, not, not the Quaker one. Uh, you know, they they have uh, um, escaped, I guess you'd say, that, that sort of uh, treatment. Also, too, I should mention for your audience that uh, uh, if you're talking to a Quaker, he would tell you that that's not a cemetery that is a burial ground. Um, and it's a matter of semantics, but basically the Quaker belief in uh, burial was that everybody had to have exactly, to be exactly the same weight before God. And so, you know, no stones or if it was stone, they were just sealed stones, uh, no flowers, nothing. So they would, they would correct you and tell you that it's not a cemetery. But I know we're getting, uh, what you're getting at with this. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot, uh, um. Over the years, I've been able to pinpoint 12 uh, cemeteries, and, and even more now because of all the expansion uh, due to the developers coming in here and expanding our, our borders. But yeah, uh, there's an awful lot of cemeteries that have been, I guess you would say, repurposed. You know, two um, that come to mind immediately, I guess, would be, or three, would be uh, under the parking lot at the Christian Baptist Church on on uh, Main Street, uh, under the parking lot of the Catholic Church on Ontario Street, and also um, 
the uh, the uh, area where the Alexandria University, I guess it's now Alexandria University home, uh, but a long time with Alexandria University uh, to, to try and move them or what they were going to do. Um, essentially, the um, decision was made that they would leave the bodies there and uh, because there are laws uh, as far as what you need to do. Repurposing of, of graveyards is, is probably going to become even more popular in the, in the future. So a lot of people who argue that it's a waste of good land uh, not to repurpose the, uh, the properties. And, and the idea is that if you show proper respect, uh, you know, you should be able to uh, and, uh, develop. But it certainly has been a trend. Uh, you know, there, as I say, there are 12 uh, that we've documented that now I guess it's more than 12. Also, you have to remember, Brad, that uh, uh, a lot of uh, cemeteries were private cemeteries. They were either family uh, internments on people's farms, or they were uh, uh, connected to some sort of an organization which did its burials. Because, you know, really until uh, the middle of the 18th century, uh, there were no um, public cemeteries. You know, if, you, if somebody died, uh, you were like, He actually built the house 
Um, and uh, as they say, through, I guess, I was going to say no fault of his own, but I guess that's not probably correct. Um, maybe he wasn't a very good businessman. I don't know what it was, but uh, he lost his business, and uh, he was very distressed, and he, and he left the uh, new market, never to be seen again. Um, I know that uh, I've done a couple of programs on uh, Mr. Gill trying to track where he went and found relatives. and back to this whole ghost story here. Yeah, well, you know, uh, if it wasn't tragic, it would be funny. Uh, I guess they were having a party. I got a new gun. Uh, we demonstrated this gun. Decided that the safest thing to do would be to fire out the, uh, the window. And... Uh, Unfortunately for him, or for the gentleman that was riding by, the gentleman riding by on a horse, and he got shot through the head uh, by uh, uh, by the gun, by the bullet uh, from the gun, and uh, that was that was uh, the earliest murder that we have on record in in, in the market. So it does have uh, you know a tie into our history. Um, how does it manifest itself? Well, there's a number of things, you know. Uh, Strange things happen with electricity, apparently lights go on or lights turn off by themselves, this sort of thing. But the interesting thing, as far as I'm concerned, is the story of a cat. Uh, a lady uh, uh, who I know uh, used, used the, the building for her, her business, and every morning when she used to come, uh, there would be a cat waiting to be fed. And so one day she uh, decided that she would ask the neighbors about the cat. And they said, there's no cat. I went on to Chicago. She uh, swore there was a cat. Cat came to the visit. The interesting thing was, once she would feed the cat, closed the door, when she opened the door, there'd be no sign of the cat. So the, the, she always claimed that, uh, that the cat was some sort of manifestation of, of, of a spirit. Uh, because it was, there, there were no footprints. I mean, I... You know, you can get really into this, and I'm sure uh, you, you had people who specialize in the spiritual world who could tell you more about this. But apparently, well, she decided one day she, what she do is she would spread mud out by the door and, and wet it down. And uh, uh, lo and behold, cats there, but no cat tracks. No tracks for the cat from the cat. So. You see that she was uh, uh, having hallucinations, or uh, you know, it was actually a cat. To be fair to her, other people have talked about the cat. Other people who have been in the building have talked about the fact that the cat comes to visit. Now, it seems to me a lot of these hauntings happen around the downtown core of the market. And the next stop is the co is the Consular Building, which is located on the north northwest corner of Main and Water, where there's what a bank attached to it. And there's uh, speculation, a story about an accounting clerk seen walking through the wall from one building to the next, carrying a ledger, and unaware of others that are in the room. Yeah. Has anybody seen this accounting clerk? Because I'd like to yeah. do some of my taxes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, if he, if he did, I don't know how much she's going to be uh, to you. Or maybe he's pretty good. I don't know. Um, yes. Uh, in fact, the people, I know several people who worked in the Bank of Nova Scotia, which was in... Uh, was was located there after they took down the original uh, part of the copper building, and um, they swore that they that they would see the apparition of this person uh, walking through. Now, the the area where the the uh, the old uh, uh, Bank of Nova Scotia or Scotia Bank building was actually where the old uh, uh, vault was, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, the feeling always was that this guy was, was going into the vault for uh, for some reason, whether it would be to do work or whatever, and this is the reason why. But yeah, they, they claim that he walked through the wall um, completely uh, uninterested in anything around it, as if there was nothing there. And what really attracts me, another location that I, that I visited periodically was the Grey Goat Inn. And there was, I didn't know this, that in the basement of the Great Goat Inn used to be a, a funeral parlor. Am I correct there? Oh, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, a lot of things from history, uh, reasons why that, that place is haunted. I should, by this point, probably point out, Brad, that uh, uh, most of the, or if not all of the, uh, of the ghosts or whatever spirits 
uh, are friendly in new markets. Uh, they may be mischievous, but they're, they're fairly friendly. Uh, the exception being the Great Oak. Uh, it's got a couple of uh, 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 presents uh, that are not friendly. Um, and you mentioned the basement. The basement, yes, was indeed used as a, um, a burial or a funeral uh, location. Uh, and uh, people who work there, uh, it's, you're hard for us to get anybody to go down in the basement. Uh, the story I uh, always, and they tell the same story, about going down to the basement and then starting up the stairs and something grabbing their leg and, and trying to pull them back down uh, into the basement. And uh, it was bad enough, uh, uh, I guess, that, uh, that people said, I'm not going down there. Uh, you know, there's, and also there's a feeling, um, and I've actually been down there a couple of times, and there is no, no doubt there's... Uh, uh, a feeling of foreboding. Uh, now, whether it is because it's just a dismal, uh, badly lit area, I don't know. Uh, but there is a, a feeling that there could possibly be um, something amiss down there. But uh, the people that work there, as one of the, you know, you talk to people who work there, they'll tell you that one of the first things that they'll say in the interview is, I'm not going downstairs. Uh, People are afraid of it. People have had instances. The other uh, thing that we have to keep in mind is that uh, one of the owners of that uh, building back in the past, um, the, the lady's husband died early, very early in their marriage, and she became a recluse. And so um, she lived her life uh, really in one room upstairs in the, in the house. Uh, and when she died, uh, I guess she was there for a little while before they, they actually removed her. Uh, so there are people who see uh, this lady walking around with a, you know, an old-fashioned candle. And then there's a ghost. Uh, is that the second floor ghost? Uh, her name was Georgette? Yes, yeah. So all these entities seem to uh, exist in this uh, great old pub. Everything from Georgette to the uh, ghost that lives in the basement in the ex uh, Funeral part of it. Oh, you know, the, the interesting thing is that, that if you, if somebody Googles uh, um, hauntings in the New York area, uh, not only does the Great Book come up, but it will tell you that according to a couple of, uh, of companies that do this sort of thing, uh, they say it's probably, it could very well be in, uh, well into the top ten hauntings in all of, uh, of Ontario. Yes. And which brings me to my next haunting, which I've, uh, I've been in there a little while ago, was the uh, Old Town Hall in the market. And I did not know that in the basement was there was a jail? Yeah, so this is where, this is where the lockup was. Uh, 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 at the, the site that uh, is fronting on to Timothy Street, this is where the police um, lockup was. So there were jails, uh, cells uh, located there. Um, when they did the renovations, they, they didn't leave the cells, but they, they left um, the openings of the cell uh, with the, the uh, uh, bars still there and graffiti uh, on the walls. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's a, uh, been a number of, of uh, instances reported. Uh, the most famous one, of course, uh, uh, is the lady who's dressed in the old-fashioned dress with the lantern standing, uh, looking out onto Botford Street, uh, you know, the, uh, what used to be the front uh, entrance to the Old Town Hall is on Botford Street. Many people will remember that, that entrance. And um, over that, on the second floor, is a picture window, and uh, there are tons of people who swear that they saw this, uh, this uh, lady standing there with a lantern looking out through the window, uh, although nothing was supposedly... Uh, you know, people would run up, uh, they would, uh, uh, they wouldn't find anything. Um, as well, uh, the other interesting one, uh, was the, the orange smell that came from the court, court, uh, well, I guess you'd say the courtroom, uh, slash theater, uh, that they had in there. Um, what it had was a gentleman, um, was in the habit of, uh, of, uh, spreading um, I guess some sort of uh, orange uh, substance which made the place smell better. He claimed that it had a stale smell and it needed to have an orange uh, 
or some sort of uh, perfume. Um, he was going home one night, and I guess he was killed. And uh, what they noticed was that even though he was no longer putting the uh, the orange uh, smell there, that there was a orange aroma uh, in the um, uh, the old courthouse uh, theater on the second floor. Uh, what is interesting is that they did all that wine, they did all that uh, to, the, to the place, but uh, you still can smell the orange blossom. And we got about two more hauntings left, and I'm sure there's a lot more, but one really that caught my eye was a sad ghost named Agatha, who resides in the old CN train station right by the Newmarket Seniors uh, Center. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about uh, Agatha. Oh, you know, she's a, she's a sad story. Uh, she, uh, I guess, she was waiting for, for her uh, fiancé to come home from the war. And uh, so she used to go every day uh, uh, waiting for the train to arrive, hoping that he was on it. Um, unbeknownst, uh, you know, he had died in the war, but I guess she was, uh, she never really accepted that. So she went every day and she sat uh, in one specific section of the, uh, the waiting room. And uh, hence the story of the ghosts, where there are people who truly really are responsible. I think responsible in the sense that there are people that I know and, you know, I don't think they, they, they drink or have hallucinations, who, who talk about the fact that there certainly uh, was a, a presence of a lady sitting all by herself uh, sobbing uh, on the, uh, in the, uh, the waiting room. And of course, the waiting room of the, uh, the old CN station is still still there very much like it was uh, right from the beginning from the time that this uh, this occurred so you know, it's kind of a sad story um you know I, uh, you kind of hope uh, that these types of stories are true because it kind of gives us hope for the you know long living on and this sort of thing it's kind of a romantic idea uh, of uh, somebody's presence there uh, pining for the loss of, uh, of a loved one well, we're leaving the best to last, and when we broadcast the show from Pickering College, it is haunted by the Grey Lady, which I wasn't aware of. And can you tell us a little bit about this ghost in Pickering College, where we broadcast from? Well, it's an interesting story. Uh, the, this is one of those, uh, those stories, Brad, that uh, where I've actually seen the piece of proof that they used to, to uh, substantiate this. Uh, I think what was happening was in the early 1900s, they were taking a, a class picture in front of the, the building. And uh, so they had everybody lined up. And uh, when they, they took a look at the photo, uh, they noticed that there was a, a picture of a lady dressed in gray, uh, which they, I think the assumption was that she may have been a matron or a nurse there. Uh, but anyway, she was looking out through the, the window, um, definitely in the, the photo. Um, and of course, uh, upon further investigation at that point, uh, they discovered that there was nobody standing there, and yet the picture uh, picked up this lady. Um, during uh, uh, one of the first times that I, I, I did articles about uh, Pickering College, I was taken on a, a tour, and uh, I remember, I don't know if it's still there, uh, they may have moved it, but um, in the uh, headmaster's office, uh, they used to have a copy of the picture, and I was lucky enough to be able to see this picture. And uh, Brad, there, there is somebody in the window. Um, whether it was a, an elaborate hoax uh, put, uh, forward by somebody, I, I really don't know. But it, it's not that she just showed up in the in the window. Uh, there there are people who say that uh, that uh, if you pick a good night, uh, that she can be seen uh, in the. Uh, in the old building, uh, walking with a, a candle. So, Gareth, don't go, don't go to the station at night, because you might bump into the gray lady. No? Okay. You said no, no, Richard. No, I know. The interesting thing they say, and uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but I probably should mention it again, um, the gist of, of, of the tours that I do um, are to talk about the history of the building or the incident. Um, all of these are based on history. I mean, uh, you know, everybody uh, loves a good book story about, uh, you know, some some house where they don't know who this is or they build over an old cemetery or whatever. But all of these uh, that, uh, that I've written about and when I do 
the, the ghost tour, uh, I usually do every it's sad because uh, the things are like they are now because usually every October I do four uh, walking tours. The 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 proceeds going to charity, uh, and it's one of the, the most fun uh, tours that we do. We shop, we look, we talk. People quite often will share their own stories of uh, of haunting places that they grew up and things like this. So it's kind of kind of fun. But they are historically based. I mean, there are explanations for what it could be. Uh, you know, we don't have any mysterious, as far as I, and ones that I do, we don't have any mysterious uh, hauntings. Of, uh, and, uh, and you asked about why it's downtown? Generally, um, of course, New Market started downtown. Uh, contrary to what most people think uh, that it started on Young Street, it actually started downtown. Uh, and this is where the old houses are. This is where the, the events happen, and uh, that's probably the reason why, you know, there's an awful lot down there, but it, it's not limited to that, and maybe, you know, another year we could talk about uh, uh, places a little further afield um, uh, to talk, uh, talk about them. Some of them, uh, one house in particular, uh, they actually took the house down uh, and built another house. It, apparently that wasn't enough to get rid of the ghost, so... Uh, it's kind of, and it's, a, it's quite a, a um, say, gruesome story. So, uh, you know, we do that on the, on the walking tour, and it's usually I, I leave it to the last because it, it is kind of a, a gruesome story. And the strange thing is that uh, even though it's a ghost story, it has, um, I guess you say, proof in the sense that the, uh, the house was so bad that they had to take the house down. Um, so... No, just very quickly to, to lead into the next year when we do this, uh, uh, we're having a young man that 